Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Second Act Actors. I'm your host, Dr. Janet McMorty, and I'm still a medical doctor simultaneously trying to pursue a career in acting. I'm also still simultaneously trying to figure out how to set up my home studio in my new city of Toronto. Toronto, you are very loud, but I love you. My guest this week is Andrea Osvart. She is a Hungarian actress, started out as a Italian literature major, and now actress, author, coach. She is phenomenal. Oh my goodness. She has been in some incredible films, acting alongside some superstars. I am not going to give them away because she talks about that a lot in this episode. She has an incredible story about trying to make it as an actor in the small country of Hungary where there isn't that much of a film industry. How do you you know, cross international borders and make a name for yourself, especially when she's just so, so talented and works so hard. She's absolutely incredible. I'm going to post a link to her appearance on The Late Show, Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson. I think it's Late Too Late's Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson because it's absolutely delightful. Everybody, please enjoy Andrea Osvart. Tell me your story. How did you get into acting? And now you're a writer as well, too. Tell me the story. Thank you so much. Yes, I consider myself an actress. And I think that's what I'm always going to be. Because even if I'm out of work, even if I'm writing at the moment, um, I, I I am still an actress. Like It's such a devotion and, and it's a pr- profession that I have chosen for myself. And I consider myself so lucky that I knew that this is what I wanted to do since the very beginning. So I remember when I was six years old, and I grew up in Hungary in the so called communist era. And I remember we didn't have a lot lot of means. And it was quite humble back then. And uh, I remember chatting with my girlfriend in the elementary school that uh, that I felt that I wanted to do something different, and something special. And um, it was not a realistic dream back then to become an actress in Hungary in the 80s. So I kept myself this little secret of mine and I didn't really talk about it for a long time until until I got into modeling and I started to make some pocket money for myself. And as soon as I had some money, I realized that the first thing I wanted to spend it on was uh, an acting training. And so I enrolled in an acting school and slowly, slowly, I gained confidence and I started to uh, see agencies and attended castings and booked some like uh, really small parts at the beginning. But I was so focused, so determined and so um, so sure about what I wanted that there was no plan B. Even my sister, I remember when my mom was worried if this going to work out. My sister used to tell my mom, uh, don't worry, it's going to work out because there is no plan B for her. So this is this was just a straight path for me. Was there ever pressure from, like, say, your mom or anyone else to not pursue this? Oh, I wouldn't call it pressure. She was rather worried. Um, you know, she didn't know this world we used to live in the countryside, so I took the train and came to the capital city of Budapest to do castings. And of course, every mother would be worried to know that uh, their daughter is catwalking in a swimming suit uh, in front of men somewhere uh, for money. So yes, she was quite worried at the beginning, but I promised her that I wouldn't interrupt my studies so that I would uh, use this career only as a mean to, um, to, to proceed 
towards acting and and to to fulfill my dream and to to make this step further that I could become independent. How did you know or like why did you know that this was what you wanted to do? What was it or what is it about acting? It's weird because I put it put this dream of mine for so long aside that um I haven't I wasn't thinking about it for so so many years during a high school and actually university where I studied Italian li- literature and arts um it was it was somehow in the back of my mind and um and then when I when I started to do the small parts in TV commercials then it came back and I just remembered oh yes now I know that why I wanted to become an actress and this is where I feel alive. So actually when I am rehearsing a part or reading a script or being on set with uh, so many exciting and creative people that that's when I feel alive. And I think this is what I like about it the most and this is what I miss the most when I'm not acting. And maybe this is the very thing that uh, other creatives experience as well when they are in the creative process of something, creating a, a movie or whatever, a song, a script, a painting, whatever it be. But it's um, it's it's like having a, a new life, like you are allowed to to do with your time and with your energy and with your thoughts and with your instinct and inspiration whatever you whatever you want i really like that like it's a yeah a, a second a second life and another life and i remember a great quote from glennon doyle who said you know oh maybe in another life i'll be uh whatever i want maybe in another life i'll pursue what i love to do and then she goes what other life there is no other life like this is it right you know this is the only life you get you have to pursue what you love to do yeah there is another quote as well i forgot who said that but it's it goes something like um you realize um you realize that you have a second life when you realize you only have one life something like that (laughs) oh my gosh oh look that hits your gut right oh my goodness so tell me about your time in university and kind of what was your life like kind of either like rediscovering your love of acting and building the acting career that you have. Mm, I I I learned in practice basically because I as I said I went to university studying arts like Italian literature and I wasn't um I I didn't go to the drama school the the official national um, drama school because in Hungary it was I was already over age by by the time I wanted to enroll and um, yeah this is there's this weird rule here that above 21 you can't be accepted anymore (gasps) yeah it's a communist thing probably oh my goodness yeah so it was for me, it was quite late, and I also needed to work. And uh, I- if you go to this uh, famous acting school, you're not allowed to work for the first three years until you're ready. Mm-hmm. So, which makes sense on some level, but it was not realistic and it was not uh, doable for me because I needed to work uh, to maintain myself. So I started to do small jobs and and do anything and and attend all castings that I I could and uh, and even though I was not considered a, a real actress at the beginning uh, in terms of I didn't have a certificate or a diploma in acting but I was so so determined and my drive was so strong to do it that eventually it was quite uh, fast my my progress quite, was quite fast and um and i was lucky enough to be cast 20 years ago in a film of uh, tony scott that was shot here in budapest and immediately i landed in a role opposite robert redford and brad pitt yes <laughs> so it was quite a start 
Oh my gosh. And then <laughs> like from there, what what where do you go from there? Like tell me about the the film industry in Hungary and how did you build from there? Yeah, the film industry is very small here. As you can imagine, it's a con country of nearly 10 million people. And uh, today, a Hungarian, uh, the Hungarian film industry is living out of the service industry. So basically, we service foreign productions who come to shoot here. Lots of productions come to shoot here. So Hungarian um, people are hired uh, to do um, work in those films. As far as national films, we are getting better. We are like maybe 25, 30 movies per year in Hungarian language, but they don't really get out of the borders, mm -hmm. as you probably haven't seen any Hungarian movie yet, mm -hmm. I suppose. Guilty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not your fault. I mean, this is how it how it is. So I, I soon realized that um, I wouldn't have any perspectives here in Hungary if I stayed in Hungary. Even though I learned languages and I spoke uh, different languages, I realized that uh, there was just not enough work for me here. And when I was 23, I, um, I left. I went to Italy because I was studying Italian language and, and arts. It was um, quite an obvious choice to go to Italy. That's where I lived for about 10 years. And that was a market that was already, you know, compared to the Hungarian one, a more Western culture market, five times bigger as Hungary, with enough work for almost everyone. I'm not saying that every actor is working there, but but I I also had a, had chances there to work, and I started to build a serious acting career there because I was fluent in Italian language. So after five years of living there, um, my career actually took off, really. And I, and I played leading parts already in Italian TV productions. In both Hungary and Italy, do you find, I'm kind of seeing a bit of parallels between where you are in, in Canada, where a lot of like Hollywood, American productions come in, hire people from Hungary, they hire people from Canada, the crew, but not necessarily the actors. They'll fly the actors in from America. And then the people, the actors in Hungary, likewise, the actors in Canada kind of go, hello, why did you fly all these people in from the States? We're here. Oh, we can we can say the lines. We can do a good job, too. Is that is that similar? Yes and no, because in Canada, you are all native English speakers, yeah. so you could really do those jobs. But in Hungary, we have maybe 10 or 20 people who, who could speak English on that level, like mm. uh, on a native level or bilingual level. Uh, so we usually just get the, the day playing parts, like one day or two, just the, the one that I mentioned with uh, Brad Pitt and Robert Redford, I had a two days shoot with one line. But it was for me the best thing that could have happened to me because it's still in my show reel and it's Absolutely. still on my resume. And uh, and people, when I went to live in LA, actually after Italy, uh, this is what the agents also liked in my show reel. Oh my God, you played with Robert Redford. So um, you never know. I I sometimes say that it's better to. To be um, not in America, not in that big pool of actors, because if there are these supporting parts that are, um, you know, discoverable in the movie and you're lucky enough to be hired as a local actor and play opposite big stars, I mean, you could still have your chances and whether if you stay in America and you compete with 100,000 other actors for the same part, it's much more difficult to to book, to book the parts. So, I mean, it's it's always frustrating. I understand that, especially in, in your case in Canada, that you do speak English uh, um, as your mother tongue, but still they fly in actors. Somehow, I think it's a matter of trust. 
that the directors, producers have trust in certain actors that they know already or they have worked together with already. So it's it's about connections, really. I I hundred percent agree, and I don't blame them, right? Yes. And if you're investing your time, energy, and money in a project. You're going to bring people with you who you know won't waste your time, energy, and money. And I think it's not just in the entertainment industry, right? Like I think about when I'm working in the hospital, you know, I'm going to work with, I'm going to pick the people that I want to work with, of course. Exactly. And, and you know who you can just work easily with together with a blink of an eye without much more, many explanations and, and uh, stupid questions, you know, and it makes life easier if you already have um, a, like not a crew, but a group of people that, you know, you can work together with because you know how complicated it is to be on set and you have a hundred things to think about and a hundred people to communicate with. You really don't have time for anything else just to focus on the job. So you went from Italy to Los Angeles, did you was the tr- the jump to Los Angeles to pursue acting? I did, yes. So did you? Because, what was that like? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it was um, 2010, and I was right after uh, the heartbreak of my life. I broke up with my boyfriend, and uh, and I realized it's it is now or never. It was just about the right time. I was 30 years old. I was not too young, not too old. I had enough credits already. I worked on my English. My English was fluent already. So I decided this is the best time. It's the last chance I have to jump and try. So I moved to LA uh, also because I wanted to be far from him. And um, and I was so willing to up-level my career um, and prove to myself, not even to the world, but most probably to myself, that I was worthy enough to be uh, cast in American movies and to play big parts and to make it internationally. And this was my goal. And actually, I realized retrospectively that having this goal in front of my eyes, it's what, um, it's what laid out the path for me to pursue to pursue and to follow so i people call me very conscious like i am a conscious person and i consciously built my career and it's partly true i i am also spontaneous of course sometimes but as far as my work is, is concerned i always know what i want and i always know why and what and and how I want to do things. And uh, I think it's very important for an actor also, for any actor, whether they're beginners or or second act actors, to to know uh, what's the, what's what's their purpose with it and what is the higher purpose, why they want to do this. And I always knew why. When, when without having, the degree from the you know drama school in Hungary how did you learn and how did you create that conscious career like how did you learn what to do yeah I was very um self-doubting at the beginning because I was a model so I I had this perception of myself that people would see me as a model turned actress which actually in my country is not a is not a very um, positive um, um, way of seeing uh, actors. And so because I had this fear of not being taken seriously, I thought I have to go to some sort of acting school to to prove that um, I did that. So I enrolled in a one-year-long and then a two-year-long um, international acting schools, like uh, part-time schools, uh, evening workshops and intensive workshops for a few days. And over maybe three or four years, I, I realized that um, I consider myself an actor now because 
It's one thing that in Hungary people only uh, know one school, but in the Western cultures it's not like that. It's just people do trainings whenever they can, wherever they can, uh, based on their schedules. So, so I did enough trainings, and and of course I I was already uh, practicing acting as I went to a lot of castings. So slowly, slowly I built up this so-called 10,000 hour rule. Uh, I'm not sure if you know this. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. So it's it, it's built up automatically, like adding up all the hours that I went to acting schools with the hours I researched for uh, casting calls and uh, I looked for agents and I watched movies and I attended events and festivals. So it, it ended up probably in 10,000 hours. And by the time I got there, I felt already like a complete actress. I think that's really a great reminder to a lot of people who I know can feel like they're left behind when they are starting a new career in whatever it is, right? In our case, you know, starting acting later on in life, feeling like they're constantly playing catch up to the people who have been acting their entire lives, went to theater school and stuff like that. I think, yeah, the staring down the barrel of 10,000 hours is pretty intimidating. But I think it's a good reminder, at least to me, being like those 10,000 hours can come from anywhere. They don't yes. need to be formal education. They can come and they don't need to be like even like you're saying, even in a formal acting class, they can be hours of doing research on your own time. Absolutely. And even watching a movie, it's like... Um, getting information and forming your taste and, you know, um, having a meeting with an agent, there is something to talk about, like, um, have you seen this movie or that you movie or um, do you know what's what's been released last week? It's all industry related work. So that's why f with me, actually, it's quite um, a thing to go to the movies, because for me, that's work. <laughs> I consider that work <laughs> to watch a movie. I can hardly uh, ever, um, you know, get distracted and, and enjoy it fully, because I'm always watching the actors and makeup <laughs> and, and the camera movement. So I counted all those hours. And sometimes I have to be honest with you, I even counted uh, sleeping because I did so many so many hours of work and I was so tired but then then when I needed to shoot I knew that I would would have to be very uh, rested for the shoot so in, in order to be able to be on top of the game for 12 hours in a row and um, you know be on top I needed to get my eight hours of sleep so when I'm shooting in that month, let's say, I am also counting, or I used to count the eight hours of sleep as well as part of my job. I think that's very, it's like an athlete, right? It's an Yeah, athlete. it's conscious. It, yes, con I love that. Because you, as an actor, your tool is your body and recovery, we know from sports, is the most important, is, is just as important, if not more important than the actual physical training so why wouldn't it be the same in any performative career? Actually, it's called performance. So, I mean, we also have to look in a certain way in front of the camera, you know, and if you show up with bad skin and dark eye circles uh, and pimples, which I have sometimes when I'm not rested, you know, my skin is rebelling. So, um so I, I absolutely agree. It's a very a severe and like a very strict uh, routine that we have to follow and maintain as actors, even as diet is concerned or fitness is concerned or sleeping is concerned. So so um, that's why people probably call me a conscious uh, person and a conscious career builder, because because I was always the first one who said good night at a certain hour at dinner because I for me it was more important to get the job done well the day after and I didn't care anything else and anybody else just you know I had a big day the day after 
and I didn't want to forget my lines or or get too tired before my scene comes up. So you know how tiring it is to to be on set. There are long waiting hours. So it it really really is important to to show up in in, in your best um, self as your best self. Well, and I think that is how, and we talked about it earlier. That's how you develop trust with other people on set, right? They are going to now trust that you, Andrea, will show up on set ready and prepared to do your job as yes. the actor on set, just like you hope everyone else around you is going to do the same. And that's, that's why I always, yeah, that's why I always tell actors who come to me for advice that I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the number one thing that the number one thing that you have to know and and I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's not about talent. It is not. It's not about your talent. That that is just one element. You can be very talented but still be unreliable. People won't work with you. And I know so many mediocre actors who constantly work because they want it and and it shows. Because they're always on time, they're prepared, they they know the craft, they know the techniques, and they they they, they deliver. As as a as opposed to hugely talented actors who I admire, and there are so many greater actors than I am, but uh, they get lost because they all they want to do is art, and all they want to do is perform, but they forget that this is also an industry and there are other people involved it's a collective art form and and the number one basic rule is respect respect for others and respect for the other people's times so it is mandatory that you you show up prepared and ready and and it's very dis- it's very embarrassing when an actor is is not prepared and it it ruins uh, all other people's work, like a hundred people's work, a hundred people's work is like destroyed because they can't shoot the scene properly as they hoped. So actors have huge responsibilities. Absolutely. And I, it's funny because I have a thought in my head now about, you know, when you're building a career, like when I'm building my career, you always hear about these actors on set who are the divas and who, you know, yeah, they're the divas, right? And I keep thinking in my head, they have earned the right to be a diva where I have not built up that clout yet. I don't have, I'm not worthy of being a diva because who am I, right? But then I think in my head, why would you ever want to earn the ability to be a a diva like do you have a thought on that like why do why does that shift happen sometimes and i know it's not every actor you know there you hear these a-list actors who are just so kind and generous and just lovely but then you hear the flip like what happens that somebody goes hi i can now strut around (laughs) i think it's a question of also the personality one has because as you said i heard Clint Eastwood is still the most humble, the humblest mm-hmm. person, and he queues for um, for the lunchbox, uh, you know, at the end of the line on set, and uh, he doesn't want to step ahead anyone. So, um, but it goes probably both ways because also if you become famous or um, acknowledged as an actor, people start to treat you differently, and people start to. Um, cherish you and um, people are like you are more taken care of probably because let's say if you are Johnny Depp I mean you, you immediately need bodyguards and a, and a chef and a personal driver and whatever or if you are Meghan Markle and you're working on a set, you probably need also, um, you know, your publicist around uh, to protect you or your assistant and and a, a whole lot of entourage. So 
other people add to it that you start to act differently and and behaving differently and then if you don't catch it then you can become a diva and uh and and maybe even um flip to the other side yeah. so take me from you are in LA what brought you back to where you are now back to Hungary yeah thank you for the question I spent three years in LA experiencing, experimenting. I was working and I was, you know, um, really enjoying myself at first because I felt like I was getting close to my dream to make it and to become a movie star. And uh, I'm in Hollywood under the palms and living in West Hollywood. So um, I really enjoyed it at first, but... Um, Slowly with time, I realized that um, I didn't belong there. Like, I couldn't get used to the mentality, really, and also the way of movie making as a business. I personally li like much more European style, independent movies that, um, that channel much more value, in my opinion, and um and i started to miss that and um and of course many other things as well it's complex and it has different elements to it and i started to miss miss home after 13 years living abroad and feeling an alien and having always this work permits as an alien uh, didn't help uh, to be honest to to make me feel like i belonged somewhere so I, I missed home and uh, I took a deep breath after a year and a half of procrastinating my decision to to move back to where I belong, to where I was born. And I now live in Budapest again for a long time now. I think it's been eight years now I'm, I've been back and uh, it's very easy from here to go anywhere. I w still work a lot uh, abroad and for me to fly to Berlin or Rome, it's one hour, or um, London, it's is two hours. So it's a great central position uh, in Europe. I feel home, and I found a way also to to make it work for myself. Even though I don't really make Hungarian movies, but um, I work a lot in Germany and um, in the surrounding countries and in, in my free time when I'm not writing and when I'm not producing, I'm also helping actors now to to build their careers. Tell me more about that. Tell me about how you're helping and tell me what you're writing as well, too. Yeah, um, when it all started with covid uh, I was out of work for um, long months, and it just didn't happen to me ever. And um, and I so I started to give it some deeper thoughts about performers and what I was lacking while not being able to perform. And uh, I started to read books about um, performer psychology, and I started to write articles like blog posts on my website. And for myself, I took notes, and um, I I talked to other actors as well, and and um, and I thought that maybe um, I was so lucky so far in the past twenty five years that I was never really out of work, but when I am now, I would really need some guidance and uh, and some inspiration and hope not to give up, um, and I did it to myself. And um, and I created this little community of actors in Hungary who I have, I have helped. And now I'm opening this up to uh, make it more international. And I started to work with actors from all over the world via Zoom. And I'm basically contacted by actors and actresses who are either beginning or who are transitioning into acting and more or less they don't know how to do it and what to do and um, I can help them with everything like even how to structure their 
um, their materials or um, how to st start what how to set their goals and what's realistic and what's not. And I basically handheld them for a three months process. That's usually how long it takes is a minimum of three months of for us to be able to to get somewhere to achieve something that is that is realistic and doable. Let it be finding an agent or getting signed up by an agent or landing a role uh, in an international movie. I just had this little girl, very, very young, 23 years old, Hungarian actress, who was so diligent and worked so hard on her English. And her goal was to be cast in in, in, in an English-speaking movie this year. And we started working in June or July. And just this week in December, she she shot her first role in a movie uh, with a director who won two Oscars already. So she's over the moon because, um, yes, because she was not lazy and she was diligent and she followed my advices and followed through step by step what needed to be done in order to be seen by these people and how to how to be in their database and how to get in front of them. So do you have any advice? I know there's, we probably have a ton of advice, but what is kind of some big pieces of advice you'd give to actors who are thinking about changing careers later on in life into acting? I think it, it would be, my first question would be to them, why? Like, why? What What is the purpose? And if they can answer that, then we then we know uh, how strong that motivation is because if the motivation is to become famous or to become rich, it's not it's not going to work. It's not going it's not enough. It's not a motivation that the universe likes. So unfortunately, um, but if there are deeper uh, purposes behind, like higher purposes that are not very selfish and egoistic. Um, then the universe listens. And um, of course, you still have to do a lot of work and put in the work. But uh, if you have a noble intentions, that's what I always believe in. If you have noble intentions, and if you put in the work and the amount of work required, then the universe listens. So first thing first, you need to be conscious about what motivates you. And, and you can start working from there. Do you have any favorite moments from your time on set? <laughs> oh my god, I have so many. <laughs> um, I don't really have one particular favorite moment. Now only the bad things come to my mind. <laughs> the bad experiences. <laughs> no, I can't pick one. I mean, what the one one uh, moment with Beth, Brad Pitt, actually, that was very funny because um, because the scene was supposed to be between me and him. And my part was I was playing the niece of uh, Robert Redford in Spy Game. And in this scene, Brad Pitt would come to my door, knock on the door, and I would give him instructions where to go to find Robert Redford. And... Uh, in the scene, I was wearing a nightgown. I was 20 years old. And during the rehearsal, he knocked and I said my line. He's upstairs on the roof. And I was expecting him to turn around and go upstairs on the roof. But he played a little game with me. And it was quite funny because during the rehearsal, once he decided to change the scene. So instead of turning around and going up to the roof, he just stepped into my room and closed the door behind himself. So, <laughs> so me and him, the two of us in a room for uh, half of a second, and all the crew was whistling and yelling and clapping and laughing. And I was so embarrassed because I thought, oh my God, I missed a new instruction or what, what is happening? You know, I was so young and naive and embarrassed, like I was stiff. But he was just trying to loosen me up a little bit. And it was a very, very personal 
uh, uh, moment that he gave to me. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, that's very unique, I think. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Do you have anything you are looking forward to coming up? I guess, you know, in 2023, we're almost done 2022. I'm looking forward to many things. I have a movie, a TV series, or not TV. It's like a net, um, sorry, again. I have a, a streaming platform series to be released on Amazon. Uh, early 2023, sometime around spring, probably. It's called The Therapy. So, um, yeah, on Amazon Prime. It's a six-episode series. And then I'm about to start to shoot a new one in February. And it's going to be a German production again. And we are supposed to shoot, we're planning to shoot in Tenerife, where I've never been before. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to both to the shoot and to the movie that's getting released. Oh, my gosh. So much exciting stuff coming. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. I'll have to keep it. Thank eye you. That. Is it available, do you think, around like worldwide on Prime? Yes, Amazon Prime. I think it's worldwide. Yeah. Fantastic. And do you have any final words of advice or words of wisdom? Yes, I mean, um, I'm also uh, in the learning process still, and I'm also gaining wisdom from the other actors who come to me, and we solve the puzzle together. So I made this new website, um, andreaosvar.coach, for my coaching um, activities, and I am now helping also other actors from all over the world to build their careers and uh, I created some worksheets and some some strategies that um, that already helped a few actors that I've worked with. So I'm also looking forward to to do it more and help more actors, uh, also from your country, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. We'll put a link to um, the website in the show notes below. And if people are interested in your books, where can they find them? Yes, uh, I have a collaborative book on Amazon.com. It's called uh, Transforming Your Life. And I wrote a chapter about my life as an actress, how, how I overcame the ups and downs in my acting career. And, and I have also an ebook that's called uh, Conscious Career Choices for Actors. And uh, you can either download it for free through my website or you can purchase it on Amazon. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And thank you, Andrea, for being my guest this week. Everybody go check out her incredible website. She has tons of information for actors, especially those actors in Europe. If you're interested in working with her, she's also just an incredible human being. Go check her out. Go check out all the media appearances and all the cool stuff that she's done with her. Amazing career. Oh, just what, what a gem. Thank you so much for being my guest. <laughs> I hope you will all tune in next week for another episode of Second Act Actors. Bye. Second Act Actors is produced and edited by me, Janet McMorty. I record using Riverside FM. If you're interested in developing an interview-based webcast like mine, I highly recommend this platform. Shoot me an email and I'll direct you to the wonderful folks there. If you or someone you know is interested in being a guest, email me at secondactactors at gmail.com. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. My love language is words of affirmation, so compliments, constructive criticism, and feedback are always welcome and encouraged. Negative Nancys, Judgy McJudgersons, or Debbie Downers, unless you're Rachel Dratch, regarding me or my guests are not welcome. It takes serious courage to share your story with the world, so if you're tempted to negatively comment about someone else's story, please ask your therapist why you're such a garbage person. Save the drama for the stage. On that happy note, I hope you'll tune in next week for another episode of Second Act Actors. Bye!